Chapter Fifteen of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Fifteen. Down the Ugambi. Halfway between the Ugambi and the village of the Waganwazam, Tarzan came upon the pack moving slowly along his old spoor. Mugambi could scarce believe that the trail of the Russian and the mate of his savage master had passed so close to that of the pack. It seemed incredible that two human beings should have come so close to them without having been detected by some of the marvelously keen and alert beasts, but Tarzan pointed out the spore of the two he trailed, and at certain points the black could see that the man and the woman must have been hiding as the pack passed them, watching every move of the ferocious creatures. It had been apparent to Tarzan from the first that Jane and Rokoff were not traveling together, the spore showed distinctly that the young woman had been a considerable distance ahead of the Russian at first, though the farther the ape-man continued along the trail, the more obvious it became that the man was rapidly overhauling his quarry. At first there had been the spore of wild beast over the footprints of Jane Clayton, while upon the top of all Rokoff's spore showed that he had passed over the trail after the animals had left their records upon the ground. But later there were fewer and fewer animal imprints occurring between those of Jane's and the Russian's feet until, as he approached the river, the ape-man became aware that Rokoff could not have been more than a few hundred yards behind the girl. He felt they must be close ahead of him now, and with a little thrill of expectation he leaped rapidly forward ahead of the pack. Swinging swiftly through the trees, he came out upon the river bank at the very point at which Rokoff had overhauled Jane as she endeavored to launch the cumbersome dugout. In the mud along the bank, the ape-man saw footprints of the two he sought, but there was neither boat nor people there when he arrived nor, at first glance, any sign of their whereabouts. It was plain that they had shoved off a native canoe and embarked upon the bosom of the stream, and, as the ape-man's eye ran swiftly down the course of the river beneath the shadows of the overarching trees, he saw in the distance, just as it rounded a bend that shut it off from his view, a drifting dugout in the stern of which was the figure of a man. Just as the pack came in sight of the river, they saw their agile leader racing down the river's bank, leaping from hummock to hummock of the swampy ground that spread between them in a little promontory which rose just where the river curved inward from their sight. To follow him, it was necessary for the heavy, cumbersome apes to make a wild detour, and Sheeta too, who hated water. Mugambi followed after them as rapidly as he could in the wake of the great white master. A half-hour of rapid traveling across the swampy neck of land and over the rising promontory brought Tarzan, by a shortcut, to the inward bend of the winding river and there before him upon the bosom of the stream he saw the dugout, and at its stern Nicholas Rokoff. Jane was not with the Russian. At sight of his enemy the broad scar upon the ape-man's brow burned scarlet, and there rose to his lips the hideous bestial challenge of the bull ape. Rokoff shuddered as the weird and terrible alarm fell upon his ears. Cowering in the bottom of the boat, his teeth chattering in terror, he watched the man he feared above all other creatures upon the face of the earth, as he ran quickly to the edge of the water. Even though the Russian knew that he was safe from his enemy, the very sight of him threw him into a frenzy of trembling cowardice, which became frantic hysteria as he saw the white giant dive fiercely into the forbidding waters of the tropical river. With steady, powerful strokes, the ape-man forged out into the stream toward the drifting dugout. Now Rokoff seized one of the paddles lying in the bottom of the craft, and, with terror-wide eyes still glued upon the living death that pursued him, struck out madly in an effort to augment the speed of the unwieldy canoe. And from the opposite bank a sinister ripple, unseen by either man, moved steadily toward the half-naked swimmer. Tarzan had reached the stern of the craft at last. One hand upstretched grasped the gunwale. Rokoff sat frozen with fear, unable to move a hand or foot, his eyes riveted upon the face of his nemesis. Then a sudden commotion in the water behind the swimmer caught his attention. He saw the ripple, and he knew what caused it. At the same instant, Tarzan felt mighty jaws close upon his right leg. He tried to struggle free and raise himself over the side of the boat. His efforts would have succeeded had not this unexpected interruption galvanized the malign brain of the Russian into instant action with its sudden promise of deliverance and revenge. Like a venomous snake, the man leaped toward the stern of the boat, and with a single swift blow struck Tarzan across the head with the heavy paddle. The ape-man's fingers slipped from their hold upon the gunwale. There was a short struggle at the surface, and then a swirl of waters, a little eddy, and then a burst of bubbles soon smoothed out by the flowing current marked for the instant the spot where Tarzan of the Apes, Lord of the Jungle, 
disappeared from the sight of men beneath the gloomy waters of the dark and forbidding Ugambi. Weak from terror, Rokoff sank shuddering into the bottom of the dugout. For a moment he could not realize the good fortune that had befallen him. All that he could see was the figure of a silent, struggling white man disappearing beneath the surface of the river to unthinkable death in the slimy mud of the bottom. Slowly, all that it meant to him filtered into the mind of the Russian, and then a cruel smile of relief and triumph touched his lips. But it was short-lived, for just as he was congratulating himself that he was now completely safe to proceed upon his way to the coast unmolested, a mighty pandemonium rose from the river bank close by. As his eyes sought the authors of the frightful sound, he saw standing upon the shore, glaring at him with hate-filled eyes, a devil-faced panther, surrounded by the hideous apes of a cut, and in the forefront of them a giant black warrior who shook his fist at him, threatening him with terrible death. The nightmare of that flight down the Ugambi, with the hideous horde racing after him by day and by night, now abreast of him, now lost in the mazes of the jungle far behind for hours and once for a whole day, only to reappear again upon his trail, grim, relentless, and terrible, reduced the Russian from a strong and robust man to an emaciated, white-haired, fear-gibbering thing, before ever the bay and the ocean broke upon his hopeless vision. Past populous villages he had fled, time and again warriors had put out their canoes to intercept him, but each time the hideous horde had swept into view to send the terrified natives shrieking back to the shore to lose themselves in the jungle. Nowhere in his flight had he seen aught of Jane Clayton. Not once had his eyes rested upon her since that moment at the river's brim his hand had closed upon the rope attached to the bow of her dugout, and he had believed her safely in his power again only to be thwarted an instant later as the girl snatched up a heavy express rifle from the bottom of the craft and leveled it full at his breast. Quickly he had dropped the rope then, and seen her float away beyond his reach. But a moment later he had been racing upstream toward a little tributary in the mouth of which was hidden the canoe in which he and his party had come thus far upon their journey in pursuit of the girl and Anderson. What had become of her? There seemed little doubt in the Russian's mind, however, but that she had been captured by warriors from one of the several villages she would have been compelled to pass on her way down to the sea. Well, he was at least rid of most of his human enemies. But at that, he would gladly have had them all back in the land of the living, could he thus have been freed from the menace of the frightful creatures who pursued him with awful relentlessness, screaming and growling at him every time they came within sight of him. The one that filled him with the greatest terror was the panther, the flaming-eyed, devil-faced panther whose grinning jaws gaped wide at him by day, and whose fiery orbs gleamed wickedly out across the water from the Cimmerian blackness of the jungle nights. The sight of the mouth of the Ugambi filled Rokoff with renewed hope, for there upon the yellow waters of the bay floated the Kincaid at anchor. He had sent the little steamer away to Cole while he had gone up the river leaving Paulvitch in charge of her, and he could have cried aloud in his relief as he saw that she had returned in time to save him. Frantically he alternately paddled furiously toward her, and rose to his feet waving his paddle, and crying aloud in an attempt to attract the attention of those on board. But, loud as he screamed, his cries awakened no answering challenge from the deck of the silent craft. Upon the shore behind him, a hurried backward glance revealed the presence of the snarling pack. Even now, he thought, those man-like devils might yet find a way to reach him, even upon the deck of the steamer, unless there were those there to repel him with firearms. What could have happened to those he had left upon the Kincaid? Where was Paulvitch? Could it be that the vessel was deserted, and that, after all, he was doomed to be overtaken by the terrible fate that he had been flying from all these hideous days and nights? He shivered, as might one upon whose brow death has already laid his clammy finger. Yet he did not cease to paddle frantically toward the steamer. And at last, after what seemed an eternity, the bow of the dugout bumped against the timbers of the Kincaid. Over the ship's side hung a monkey ladder, but as the Russian grasped it to ascend to the deck, he heard a warning challenge from above, and looking up, gazed into the cold, relentless muzzle of a rifle. After Jane Clayton, with rifle leveled at the breast of Rokoff, had succeeded in holding him off until the dugout in which she had taken refuge had drifted out upon the bosom of the Ungambi beyond the man's reach, she had lost no time in paddling to the swiftest sweep of the channel, nor did she for long days and weary nights cease to hold her craft to the most rapidly moving part of the river, except when during the hottest hours of the day she had been wont to drift as the current would take her, lying prone in the bottom of the canoe, her face sheltered from the sun with a great palm-leaf. Thus only did she gain rest upon the voyage. At other times she continually sought to augment the movement of the craft by wielding the heavy paddle. Rokoff, on the other hand, had used little or no intelligence in his flight along the Ugambi, so that more often than not his craft had drifted in the slow-moving eddies, 
for he habitually hugged the bank farthest from that along which the hideous horde pursued and menaced him. Thus it was, that though he had put out upon the river but a short time subsequent to the girl, yet she had reached the bay fully two hours ahead of him. When she had first seen the anchored ship upon the quiet water, Jane Clayton's heart had beat fast with hope and thanksgiving, but as she drew closer to the craft and saw that it was the Kincaid, her pleasure gave place to the greatest misgivings. It was too late, however, to turn back, for the current that carried her toward the ship was much too strong for her muscles. She could not have forced the heavy dugout upstream against it, and all that was left her was to attempt either to make the shore without being seen by those upon the deck of the Kincaid, or to throw herself upon their mercy, otherwise she must be swept out to sea. She knew that the shore held little hope of life for her, as she had no knowledge of the location of the friendly Masala village to which Anderson had taken her through the darkness of the night of their escape from the Kincaid. With Rokoff away from the steamer, it might be possible that by offering those in charge a large reward they could be induced to carry her to the nearest civilized port. It was worth risking, if she could make the steamer at all. The current was bearing her swiftly down the river, and she found that only by dint of the utmost exertion could she direct the awkward craft toward the vicinity of the Kincaid. Having reached the decision to board the steamer, she now looked to it for aid, but to her surprise the decks appeared to be empty, and she saw no sign of life aboard the ship. The dugout was drawing closer and closer to the bow of the vessel, and yet no hail came over the side from any lookout aboard. In a moment more, Jane realized, she would be swept beyond the steamer, and then, unless they lowered a boat to rescue her, she would be carried far out to sea by the current and the swift ebb tide that was running. The young woman called loudly for assistance, but there was no reply other than the shrill scream of some savage beast upon the jungle-shrouded shore. Frantically, Jane wielded the paddle in an effort to carry her craft close alongside the steamer. For a moment it seemed that she should miss her goal by but a few feet, but at the last moment the canoe swung close beneath the steamer's bow, and Jane barely managed to grasp the anchor chain. Heroically, she clung to the heavy iron links, almost dragged from the canoe by the strain of the current upon her craft. Beyond her, she saw a monkey ladder dangling over the steamer's side. To release her hold upon the chain, and chance clambering to the ladder as her canoe was swept beneath it, seemed beyond the pale of possibility. Yet to remain clinging to the anchor chain appeared equally as futile. Finally, her glance chanced to fall upon the rope of the bow of the dugout, and making one end of this fast to the chain, she succeeded in drifting the canoe slowly down until it lay directly beneath the ladder. A moment later, her rifle slung about her shoulders, she had clambered safely back to the deserted deck. Her first task was to explore the ship, and this she did, her rifle ready for an instant use should she meet with any human menace aboard the Kincaid. She was not long in discovering the cause of the apparently deserted condition of the steamer, for in the forecastle she found the sailors, who had evidently been left to guard the ship, deep in drunken slumber. With a shudder of disgust, she clambered above, and to the best of her ability closed and made fast the hatch above the heads of the sleeping guard. Next she sought the galley for food, and, having appeased her hunger, she took her place on deck, determined that none should board the Kincaid without first having agreed to her demands. For an hour or so nothing appeared upon the surface of the river to cause her alarm, but then, about a bend upstream, she saw a canoe appear on which sat a single figure. It had not proceeded far in her direction before she recognized the occupant as Rokoff, and when the fellow attempted to board, he found a rifle staring him in the face. When the Russian discovered who it was that repelled his advance, he became furious, cursing and threatening in the most horrible manner. But, finding that these tactics failed to frighten or move the girl, he at last fell to pleading and promising. Jane had but a single reply for his every proposition, and that was that nothing could ever persuade her to permit Rokoff upon the same vessel with her that she would put her threats into action and shoot him, should he persist in his endeavors to board the ship he was convinced. So, as there was no other alternative, the great coward dropped back into his dugout, and, at imminent risk of being swept to sea, finally succeeded in making the shore far down the bay, and upon the opposite side from that on which the horde of beasts stood snarling and roaring. Jane Clayton knew that the fellow could not alone and unaided bring his heavy craft back upstream to the Kincaid, and so she had no further fear of an attack by him. The hideous crew upon the shore she thought she recognized as the same that passed her in the jungle far up the Ungambi several days before, for it seemed quite beyond reason that there should be more than one such a strangely assorted pack, but what had brought them downstream to the mouth of the river she could not imagine. Toward the day's close, the girl was suddenly alarmed by the shouting of the Russian from the opposite bank of the stream, and a moment later, following the direction of his gaze, she was terrified to see a ship's boat approaching from upstream, in which, she felt assured, 
there could only be members of the Kincaid's missing crew, only heartless ruffians and enemies. End of chapter 15